Most professional footballers, either in retirement or towards the end of their careers, go into the media, coaching, or have a clean break from football and move into the world of business. There is a lesser trodden path though, which is not for the faint-hearted, and that is owning your own football club. Indeed, in the case of Gary Neville, it is actually possible to do all of the above. Neville, along with his brother Phil, former teammates David Beckham, Ryan Giggs, Paul Scholes and Nicky Butt, and Singaporean billionaire Peter Lim, own Salford City FC. Each of the former Manchester United players own 10% of the former non-league side, whilst Lim owns the remaining 40%. Under their stewardship, which initially began in 2014 without Lim or Beckham, Salford won four promotions in five seasons, and they are now eyeing promotion to League One. Salford City aren't the only football club that David Beckham owns. The Qatar endorsing knighthood chasing former England captain also owns between a 10 to 25% stake in MLS newbies into Miami, who he was able to found at an enormous discount as the result of a clause that was written into his contract when he arrived in the MLS from Real Madrid with LA Galaxy in 2007. Everyone knows about the class of 92 ownership of Salford City and David Beckham's part ownership of Inter Miami though, or the vast majority of people who follow football at least. Less well known perhaps is the fact that Cesc Fabregas and Thierry Henry are both part owners of Fabregas' new club Como, who compete in Serie B, that Didier Drogba is a minority shareholder in his last club, Phoenix Rising, and Zlatan Ibrahimovic owns a quarter of top flight Swedish outfit Hammerby. It is those more interesting and obscure examples that are the subject of this seven. So without any further ado, here are seven footballers who own professional football clubs. Seventh, Ronaldo Luis Nazario de Lima. Undoubtedly the best known owner in this seven, many of you will know that legendary Brazilian forward Ronaldo is now the owner of a football club. But the fact that he owns not one, but two football clubs, both of which have quite interesting stories behind them, meant that I still couldn't leave him out. Ronaldo was the best player on the planet for probably five or six years, and he almost certainly would have gone down as one of the greatest players of all time were it not for a combination of injuries, excruciating pain, and hypothyroidism that made it difficult for him to stay in shape and ultimately forced him to retire. Ronaldo was also one of the best paid players on the planet for roughly a decade, and despite being renowned for his party lifestyle, Ronaldo is reportedly very frugal with his money. He also founded a talent agency called Nine, after hanging up his boots, whose clients have included the likes of Neymar and several Brazilian UFC fighters. Long story short, Ronaldo is rich, estimated to be worth at least 160 million US dollars, and he has invested some of that money back into the sport. The first football club that Ronaldo invested in was actually a revival of the Fort Lauderdale Strikers, where he became a part owner in 2014, with talk that Ronaldo might even attempt to come back as a player in Florida. He did not, and the project quickly soured, with the club ultimately dissolved in 2016. Undeterred though, in 2018, Ronaldo acquired a 51% controlling interest in Real Valladolid, paying 30 million euros for the privilege. In 2020, the two-time Ballon d'Or winner increased his stake in the Spanish outfit to 82%. Valladolid were relegated from La Liga in 2021, but won promotion back up to the top flight at the first attempt last season, and they are currently 18th, six games into the current La Liga campaign. Ronaldo has already made it clear that he doesn't plan on owning Valladolid long-term, stating that his ambition is to keep the club in La Liga, challenge for Europe, and then move on to other ventures. Those other ventures might already have begun, as in December 2021, Ronaldo paid $70 million through his company Tara Sports to acquire a 90% stake in his boyhood club Cruzeiro, with whom Ronaldo scored 44 goals in 47 games in his teens. Despite being one of Brazil's traditional Big 12, Cruzeiro have been beset by crises in recent years, and currently compete in the Campeonato Brasileiro Serie B, which is the second tier of Brazilian football. 
Ronaldo, who saw off competition from Liverpool owners Fenway Sports Group to take over at Cruzeiro, is now looking to get the club back on track and move them into a new stadium. And I have made an entire video about the Brazilian Giants and their demise, should any of you be interested. He has got off to a pretty good start, as Cruzeiro became the first team to win promotion to the Brasileiro Serie A earlier this week. Interestingly, Ronaldo revealed last year that, before buying Real Valladolid, he had been in talks with both Charlton Athletic and Brentford, but said that the valuations of English clubs were much higher than those anywhere else in the world. 6. Demba Bar Though not quite in the same bracket as Ronaldo, Demba Bar was a very good centre-forward. At West Ham, Newcastle, and during his single season with Besiktas, Bar was outstanding. Yet, to a lot of people, he will always just be that guy who scored after Gerrard slipped on his arse. One thing that I always found strange about Bar was that, whilst his goal-scoring record at club level was generally very impressive, he scored 215 goals in 465 games in total, he only managed three goals from just 22 caps for Senegal. How can that be? Especially when someone like Mambiram Juf, with all due respect, has bagged 10 in 47 for the Lions of Taranga. Perhaps a Senegalese subscriber will be able to enlighten me and anyone else who has wondered about that down below in the comments. Barr announced his retirement just over a year ago, less than three months after signing for Swiss outfit FC Lugano. By that stage, Barr had already spent four years in football ownership, having co-founded an NASL team called San Diego 1904 FC, alongside former teammates Eden Hazard, Johan Kabai, and Musa So. There was some confusion about the reasoning behind the 1904 in the club's name, which was suggested by a supporter, and Barr and Co's franchise would get off to a pretty tough start. They were due to make their league debuts in the 2018 NASL season, before it was cancelled. Then they applied to join the USL, but failed to reach an agreement with the league, before finally finding a home in the NISA, which is one of three third tiers in American soccer, and was only founded in 2019. In their first season, San Diego 1904 played in the 70,561-seat San Diego Stadium, which was demolished in 2020. In 2021, after withdrawing from the NISA, the club merged with Albion San Diego, who also compete in the NISA, and play at the more modest 2,400 capacity Canyon Crest Stadium. It is unclear just how much involvement Hazard, Kabai, and So now have, but when the two clubs' boards merged, Barr became Albion's new chairman, despite apparently living in Paris. For Barr, who arrived in California promising that there was, quote, no room for failure, and with plans to build a purpose-built 10,000-seater football stadium in San Diego, things haven't exactly gone to plan, and his investment has scaled back significantly since merging with Albion San Diego. Fifth, Hector Bayerin. At the age of 27, Hector Bayerin is the youngest player in this seven, and perhaps even more surprisingly, he acquired his ownership stake in an English football club over two years ago, when he was still at Arsenal. Bayerin spent a total of 11 years at Arsenal, the first of which was spent in the club's academy, and the last of which he spent on loan at Real Betis. After winning a Copa del Rey with Betis last season, Bayerin joined his boyhood club Barcelona on a free transfer this summer, but his ties to English football didn't end there. Outside of football, Bayerin has been outspoken about a number of issues, not least the environment. He has been a vegan since 2017, for both health, sporting, and environmental reasons, and he pledged to plant 3,000 trees in the Amazon for every game that Arsenal won after football resumed in the 2019-20 season. A few years back, when Arsenal played Forest Green Rovers, Bayerin discovered a football club whose values seemed to align with his own. Recognised by both FIFA and the United Nations as being the world's greenest football club, Forest Green became the world's first vegan football club in 2015, and the world's only carbon neutral football club in 2017. That is because Forest Green is owned by so-called eco-tycoon Dale Vince, who owns the green energy firm Ecotricity, and has sought to create a football club in his own image. 
Bayern's investment in Forest Green was relatively modest, reported to have been around £250,000 for approximately 2% of the club, which still makes him the club's second largest shareholder behind Vince. Bayern and Vince, perhaps unsurprisingly given their passion for the climate, also share political inclinations. Vince has donated to both the Green Party and the Labour Party in the past, endorsing Labour in the 2019 general election. Meanwhile, Bayerin famously tweeted on the day of the 2019 general election, encouraging young people to vote with the hashtag F Boris. Bayerin has played two games for Barcelona so far this season. Meanwhile, Forest Green Rovers have endured a tough start to the current campaign in League One after winning promotion from League Two but losing their manager Rob Edwards to Watford last season. Fourth, Paolo Maldini. A half-decent centre-back who later did an alright job covering at left-back at AC Milan, Paolo Maldini made 902 appearances for the Rosaneri, where he won seven Serie A titles, five Champions Leagues, and twice came third in Ballon d'Or voting. As is a bit of a theme among former, and indeed current footballers, the club that Maldini co-owns is based in the United States. Founded in 2015, Miami FC made their NASL debut in the 2016 season and now compete in the USL Championship after the NASL folded in 2017. The team's principal owner is Ricardo Silva, who some of you might recall if you watched the video that I made about why all of football's individual awards have become almost entirely meaningless. That's because Silva owns the Globe Soccer Awards, a Dubai-based football awards ceremony where George Mendes' clients just seem to win almost all of the awards, purely coincidentally, I've no doubt, although it is worth pointing out that Silva just so happens to be the major shareholder of Mendes' Jester Fute agency. I know, really weird. The Italian also owns AC Milan's official TV channel and has been its CEO since 2001, which is presumably how he knows Paolo Maldini and Alessandro Nesta who became his co-owner at Miami FC, in Maldini's case, and the club's new first-team boss in Nesta's, back in 2015. There was a lot of talk, at the time, about how the Italians had beat David Beckham to the punch in founding a Miami-based soccer team. Though, of course, Beckham's franchise would compete in the MLS, which is a whole different ball game to the USL Championship. Miami FC did have aspirations of becoming an MLS club themselves, but that now seems highly improbable, in the short term at least. Nesta resigned as manager in 2017, and whilst Maldini still maintains his minority ownership stake, his focus has been very much back in Milan since 2018, when he became his former club's new sporting strategy and development director. Maldini was promoted to technical director in 2019, and he played a pivotal role in helping Milan win their first Serie A title in over 10 years last season. Miami FC, meanwhile, are currently 7th out of 14 teams in the USL Championship Eastern Conference. Third, Mark Palios. Most of the players in this seven are either still active or retired during this millennium, but there are a fair few former footballers turned owners who are a little bit longer in the tooth. Dave Whelan, for example, who spent more than 20 years as Wigan Athletic chairman and even longer owning the club, famously played for Blackburn Rovers in the late 1950s and missed the 1960 FA Cup final after he broke his leg. A fact that everyone in English football knows since Whelan never tires of reminding anyone that he speaks to almost every time he opens his mouth. Mark Palios, oddly enough, who is a little younger than Whelan, actually spent a very similar amount of time and played a very similar number of games as Whelan for Crew Alexandra. Crew were one of five clubs that Palios represented, the most notable of which being Tramia Rovers, which is where he began his career, and he played about 200 games. Towards the end of his career, Palios began working as an accountant, very quickly rising up through the ranks. In 2003, he was named as the Turnaround Financier of the Year, which I hope you won't mind me saying, sounds like one of the most boring awards known to man. Still, at least it isn't as rigged as the Globe Soccer Awards. Admittedly, I really have no way of knowing that for a fact, but it would take some effort. Palios became Chief Executive of the Football Association later that year, 
famously making the decision to ban Rio Ferdinand for skipping a drugs test, which saw the England star miss Euro 2004. Palios's time at the FA ended fairly swiftly, after it was revealed that both he and England boss Sven Goran Eriksson had both had affairs with FA secretary Faria Alam. In 2014, Palios returned to football, acquiring a controlling interest in his old club Tramia Rovers alongside his wife. Tramia had just been relegated from League One at the time, and in Palios's first season owning the club, Tramia were relegated again, falling out of the Football League for the first time since they were elected as members back in 1921. They returned to League 2 in 2018, later receiving investment from the Indonesian holding company, Santini Group, and the club from Merseyside are mid-table in League 2 during the early part of this season. Second, Gerard Piquet. Hopefully obscure enough to make my seven, if not I will give you Cesar Azpilicueta's involvement and part ownership of Hashtag United, and former Inter Milan and Monaco striker, Mohamed Callon, who owns a club called FC Callon, in his own name, who play in his native Sierra Leone as bonuses, but Gerard Piquet, as some of you will know, owns FC Andorra. One of the most decorated defenders ever to have played the game, Piquet is like Spanish football's answer to Gary Neville in terms of his vast array of business interests. The Barcelona legend is the founder and president of Cosmos Holdings, which struck a $3 billion partnership with the International Tennis Federation in 2018 to transform the Davis Cup. Cosmos Holdings has received some external investment, unsurprisingly, given the vast sums involved, including from US billionaire and cloud tech entrepreneur Larry Ellison. In December 2018, PK bought FC Andorra through Cosmos, winning promotion to the Tercera division after going on a 22-game unbeaten run during his first season at the club. Although Andorra is a fully independent principality, with a population of fewer than 100,000 people, FC Andorra have competed in the Spanish Football League system since 1948. Last season, Andorra won promotion to the Segunda Division, just one league below PK's current club Barcelona, in La Liga. That is great for Andorra, but it also opens up the possibility of one or two potential conflicts of interest, especially since PK has made no secret of his ambitions to one day become Barcelona president. In the summer just gone, we saw the first glimpse of potentially messy situations, as both Barca and FC Andorra were interested in signing young midfielder Sergi Altamira. Ultimately, they both missed out, along with Villarreal, failing to complete paperwork before the deadline passed. But it is a potential conflict that might be worth keeping an eye on. First, Jamie Vardy. Don't ask me why, but in my eternal ignorance and prejudices, WKD and party-loving Jamie Vardy, whose pre-game ritual supposedly includes drinking a glass of port, three Red Bulls, and a double espresso for good measure, is just about the last active footballer who I would expect to own a club as well. Yet, I would, as is so often the case, be proven horribly wrong. What's more, it doesn't just seem as though Vardy's investment in yet another American soccer club, Rochester Rhinos in his case, has just come in the form of a simple cash injection. Despite still being very much active in the Premier League at Leicester City, now aged 35, Vardy acquired what he described as a meaningful enough share to have a seat at the table in the Rochester Rhinos in the summer of 2021. The Rhinos, who at that point hadn't actually played a game of football since 2017, are famously the only non-MLS club to have won the US Open Cup. Vardy said at the time that the club's past, which has always been eventful and in which they have defied the odds on multiple occasions, resonated with his own. Vardy, of course, played non-league football up until the age of 25, yet he has gone on to score more Premier League goals than Cristiano Ronaldo and Didier Drogba. Vardy acquired a minority stake in the Rhinos, alongside David and Wendy Dawkins, who bought the club back in 2016, and also part owned the NBA franchise, the Sacramento Kings. It was Vardy's agent John Morris who first put the Dawkins and the Leicester City striker in touch, 
and Rochester made their return to football in 2022, competing in the inaugural 2022 MLS Next Pro as the only non-MLS reserve team in the league. In one of America's third tiers, the Rhinos, who have actually renamed themselves Rochester New York FC this season, which I think is quite frankly a travesty, finished fourth in the Eastern Conference this season, and they play their conference playoff semi-final against Columbus Crew's reserve team tomorrow, which gives us a nice topical ending to this video. I still can't believe they removed Rhinos from the name, though, and replaced it with New York. What were they thinking? Anyway, that is it for today's video. I hope that you enjoyed it. Hit the like button if that was the case. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments. And make sure that you are subscribed and have notifications turned on for HITC7s. You can also find me on Twitter or on Instagram via the username at HITC7s on both, should you wish to do so. Cheers and have a sensational weekend.